for today's program, I want to talk about the concept of migration, immigration, emigration, because we have three words that are very similar, but they represent different things. It's like flammable, inflammable, non-flammable. We know that they have to do with burning something, but they have a specific purpose for using each of the different words. So I want to talk about this in terms of the migratory behavior of people. And I think this will add some understanding for you when you read the assigned pieces and might help you take a different angle with your essays. So let's get right into it. But be aware we're going to need to use some geography and history to explain the linguistics that are going on here. So migration means the permanent or semi movement of a population. So already we know that it's not an individual. It's not people taking a vacation. It's a relocation. The slide that you see here is a representation on a map of what we call the Great Migration, which is the movement of African-Americans from the Deep South to northern and western cities took place in the late 1800s, early part of the 1900s. So you had great masses of people who decided to leave the Deep South and move to areas where they might be better received, where there might be more jobs and business opportunities. So when you have clusters of people who move somewhat together from one place to another, that's a migratory pattern. So the Great Migration is one of those movements that took place in American history. But remember, that means it's permanent or semi-permanent. These are people who are leaving behind where they came from and are committing themselves to where they are going to. Now, we've got the similar words, but they start differently. So we have the prefix M, I am, and we have the prefix M, E M. So when we think of it, immigration is the process of moving into a country. So we can use the letter I to think of immigration is in. Emigration is moving out of a country or an exit. So you could use the E to help you remember to keep those two words straight. So immigration, emigration, two different things, the process of moving in or the process of moving out. So we get some important vocabulary words for you that have to do with this process. An immigrant is a person who is coming into the new country or the new territory. But notice for the person who is leaving, we traditionally use the French word emigre, which means the person who left. So if I left the United States and I moved to England, I would be an immigrant to England, but I would be an emigre from the United States. Slightly different is an expatriate, sometimes called an expat, which is a person who is living outside the native country. And we have a picture here of our author F. Scott Fitzgerald, with whom we're already familiar from The Great Gatsby. But he, Hemingway, and other literary figures chose Paris as the place to live and interact with each other. That was the popular trend of the times. So Fitzgerald would be an expat, still an American citizen. He had not become a French citizen, but he had taken residence in France. The last word is for the person who moves because they had no choice. So a refugee is a person who is leaving their original country and going someplace else to seek refuge, which means safety. And they could be fleeing a political turmoil, like a country has changed government. They could be fleeing a collapsed economy where the money is worthless and they have to go someplace that has a standard of living. They could be fleeing from a great natural disaster. 
where after a big earthquake or flood, a bunch of people have to relocate to a different place. Even here in the States, after Hurricane Katrina, there were refugees who left New Orleans and relocated to Houston, Texas, or up to St. Louis, Missouri, and have stayed there. So in a sense, even within a country, you could have a refugee from one region to another. Most often we think about this, though, as people who are crossing borders, like from Lebanon to Syria or Syria to Lebanon, where there's a war and people are being displaced from their home country and they have to take up a way to live in a new country. Here's a word with which you may not be familiar, diaspora. It comes from an ancient Greek word that means the scattering. And it means the dispersal of a population. So look at the similarity in the way the words are constructed, diaspora and dispersal. So we can see they come from the same root word. In this case, we're talking about a population that doesn't get to move together, but instead individual groups of families or sections of people wind up in different places all around the world, spread out like a shotgun blast. So this idea of a scattered population, it's not as if these people just moved from one country into the next door country. They moved to a lot of different places. So this is something for us to consider as well when we talk about population movement. One that we can look at is the Jewish diaspora. This happened from about 200 BC to about 200 AD, but where the Jewish people were scattered from their conquered homelands and wound up, as you see, all over Europe and Africa, wound up in Spain, wound up in Eastern Europe. So the Jewish people as a whole were broken up and wound up in many different places and then start establishing traditions and cultures in their new homes. There's also the African diaspora, and this map gives you a representation of where the African people were taken during the slave trade days and where they wound up, how they wound up in the places that they're associated with today which explains why you have African people who are in Brazil or in Jamaica or in Cuba, because it wasn't just to the United States. And the thickness of these lines gives you a proportional representation of the actual number of people who were forcibly displaced from where they were and where they went to. So, just as the Jewish people got scattered, the African people also got scattered during this bad period of time. So the term diaspora can be used for any forced scattering of a recognizable group of people. Even in the United States, this map shows what is called the Trail of Tears, which is the forced relocation of the Cherokee people, as well as other native peoples from the deep south over to Oklahoma. And if you look at old maps of the United States, I have one in a geography textbook my grandmother gave me from like 1903. Half of Oklahoma was still called Indian Territory by its formal name that all of it did not become the state of Oklahoma until much later. So this idea of forcibly moving people across a country or out of a country and having them resettle someplace else, this has happened more times in human history than we like to remember, but we should remember it because that teaches us how these kinds of things really work. The opposite of this scattering of people is the forced concentration of people. And in this slide, you see the Berlin Wall, which for several decades 
actually separated the free part of the city of West Berlin from the communist dominated part of East Berlin. Now the whole city actually sat in the communist controlled area, East Germany. So you had a divided country that had within it a divided city. So automatically you can understand that this is a situation that the people didn't want, but that was imposed on them. So this idea of concentrating peoples for political reasons, for control, uh, for ethnic discrimination, this again is an old historic idea, but it is the opposite of dispersal concentration. So keep these two concepts in mind. Here we see a representation on a map of where the Nazi government of Germany had concentration camps. And if we think of it only as being Jews, because there were some six million Jews exterminated in this process, we're really not getting the whole story because also considered undesirables were Russian and Slavic peoples, uh, the Romani people, and also people that had any mental or physical disabilities. Also homosexuals were considered undesirables. So in this process of rounding up people that the government did not favor and putting them in these fixed places, we can see that it happened a lot and it happened to a lot of different kinds of people. So I want you to have a broader idea of who it is that might be being affected and how, how big a scale it might have been. Now, we might know the names of some infamous camps like Bergen-Belsen or Dachau or Auschwitz, but many, many, many more infamous names all over Nazi-controlled territories. So it is a much bigger deal, I think, than we uh, take it in casual conversation. In literature terms, we talk about something called the other, which is just whoever is in the outside group that the dominant group is unfavorably disposed to, that uh, is taking advantage of, that is dominating them. So when we can take any group of people and mentally justify them as being the other, being something different, then sadly throughout history, the powerful group has been able to use the people in that status of other and treat them in a bad way for their own benefit. This, this sadly is a story that occurs throughout history. But keep this map in mind for a moment. And look again at the way the Jewish people were dispersed throughout Europe. Now hold that picture in your mind. And look at the pattern of where the camps were. So clearly there was a correlation to where the Jewish populations were located. But as I said, we should not think of this as only having been a Jewish phenomenon. It certainly was by majority, but many other peoples were affected as well. This is a map of the former Soviet Union. The area in white would be Russia, but the red dots indicate where gulags, G-U-L-A-G, were located, which were concentration camps for the undesirable people under the communist government of the Soviet Union. So these were prison camps and forced labor camps. And again, spanning the entirety of the country and other countries over which Russia had dominance. So this is something to be aware of that we know of the, the Nazi camps, 
but we should not forget the Soviet camps. Which brings us then to the camps that are represented in one of the pieces of literature that you have to read, which are the Japanese relocation centers during the period of World War II. And again, it's easy to think, well, that was something that happened over in California, and indeed it did. But if you see the map and the true history of it, there are also people lo relocated as far east as Arkansas. So this was a much bigger operation, perhaps, than we might think, which makes it worthy of study in terms of history and in terms of the literature. I want to draw your attention to that gray area on the West Coast called the Military Exclusion Area. This was the area where they intended to have any people of Japanese heritage removed. This is the executive order by President Roosevelt that's referred to in the title of one of the pieces of literature you have to read. The fear was that if there were Japanese people in that part of the Western United States, they might help our military enemy at that time, the Japanese in the Pacific. Now, here's a fact of history of which you may not be aware. There were plenty of Jap excuse me, Japanese Americans who fought for the United States in World War II. But they fought in Europe where they would not be confused with the Japanese enemy in the Pacific. So these Nisei, N-I-S-E-I, -E soldiers fought very gallantly and received many medals and awards for bravery fighting in the European half of the war rather than the Pacific half of the war. So consider this, that on the one hand, the American government was very concerned about the loyalty of Japanese Americans on the west coast of the country, but recognized, rewarded, and gave glory to Japanese Americans who fought for the United States but did it in Europe at the very same time in history. Both of these were happening during the early 1940s simultaneously. So that's just a challenging thought to keep in your mind. How could they have been good one place and bad another place? And it speaks to the kind of unreasoning fear and prejudice that sometimes drives human behavior. At that point in time, and this is uh, November of 1943, you can see by the red area on the map how far the Japanese had expanded, how much they had conquered in their part of World War II. So they definitely were an expansionist empire and they were taking over areas like the Philippines and uh, into New Guinea, almost to Australia. But remember from what we know about history, there highlighted in yellow is Hawaii, where the Japanese had attacked our naval facility at Pearl Harbor, which is really what got the United States into the war overall as an active combatant, not just an industrial power assisting our allies. So let me change the map a little bit, but keep in mind there where Hawaii is located. All right. So we see now the total Pacific Ocean. On the left-hand side of the page, you can see Japan in the top left corner. On the right-hand side of the page, the upper right, you can see the outline of North America and the California coast. And there in the dead center is Hawaii. Now I'm going to give you a couple bits of arithmetic. By air, it's 3,800 miles from Tokyo to Honolulu. Now, we did not actually have 
Japanese planes come all that distance, they were launched from aircraft carriers that had already gone out far into the ocean. When the United States retaliated and attacked Japan, our bombers came off of aircraft carriers that were out in the ocean. But for the sake of rough figuring, we're looking at under 4,000 miles from Japan to Hawaii, which was an American territory. So holding that figure, it's only 2,500 miles from Honolulu to Los Angeles. So this idea of the Japanese being able to reach out and attack the western coast of the continental United States was a legitimate thing that people were afraid of. And there were great anti-aircraft cannon emplacements put up on the west shore of the United States looking out to sea. And there were air raid scares where people thought it was Japanese planes. So not to justify the horrible treatment of rounding up American citizens with Japanese heritage and putting them in relocation camps. That was awful. That was wrong. That should not have happened. But when you think about what people were concerned about, that whether or not we could get bombed from Japan, the arithmetic supported that that was a possibility. It had nothing to do with Japanese American people that were living in California and paying taxes, raising families, going to school, having a job, being regular American people like anybody else. So it just takes one grain of fact to somehow make people or governments uh, freak out and do indefensible things. So now our understanding of the United States in this military exclusion area, we understand what the military thing was that made that thought get into the government's head. And to do this atrocious thing to American citizens within the boundaries of the United States. I hope that helps you understand this process of migration, immigration, relocation, so that you can keep these concepts separate, so that when you read our literature and you write about it, that you can keep the concept straight about who is moving and why and where from and where to, because that is what will make your essays be more correct and more accurate in the way that you interpret our pieces that we have to read during this current unit. That's going to take care of my prepared remarks. I'll go ahead and cut off the recording so we can have some open discussion.